Hello, welcome to South County Spotlight on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm your host, Chris Collins. As always, you know, the last time we had Carolyn Shores Ness in here, we didn't get to really scratch even the surface of what we wanted to talk about, so we decided to have her on for a second show. So, a couple things specifically we want to get into, one of which is town meeting, which is coming up, but off here we were having a conversation which I think is pretty interesting, and that is, you know, the, the world has really changed for government officials with the advent of social media. And, I, and I've noticed this, there have been times where, you know, I now find, I'm, I track a lot of politics on social media. For me, Facebook is one of the great tools for any journalist because you can get a handle on what's going on and really get a feel for what people are thinking. But there are drawbacks too. And as a public official, you tend to have, see both sides of it. So talk a little bit about how social media has changed your job. Well, I think social media has, is wonderful in, in um, most cases because we can communicate better within town hall and out in the community and we're certainly well aware of, of what's going on um, with social media. But one of the things that people, I think, get frustrated with is that we still have open meeting law yeah. um, requirements. We have pu public record requirements. And so for us to respond as public officials, you can't respond at the same immediacy. And I think people get frustrated. And that, that is a real issue, I think. And that's the th one of the things I've seen in you know, the, my duration here is that you know, there is a frustration with local officials, like how come you're not out there more in the front? But we can't make decisions. We can't, you know, you're, you have to meet as a board, you have to post. Even in emergency, you have to still post. And, and so it, it's difficult to respond in, to the community and and so what we try to do what we're trying to do is change the workplace culture a lot um, you know in anticipation of that and is trying to have our, our uh, town employees more um, ready for things more prepared and we, we're stressing you know trainings and safety and so you have a lot less stuff and and you and you try and are we're looking at trends and predictions and I think um, having our department heads, current department heads that we have, are getting it. And so we're a lot more prepared, we're a lot, we have a lot more policies in place and ways to react that is um, really different from just a few years ago. It's tough though because change can be glacial and, and social media has sort of taken people by storm it seems like, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all the various uh, ramifications. In terms of the open meeting law, what a lot of people don't realize is that as a three-member board, I mean, by the letter of the law, two of you can't have a conversation on a street corner without a public posting, which is going to make it very... And, and look, I've seen this law fractured in my career a lot. I remember the previous board of selectmen, before you were on there, they'd have a meeting, they'd go across the street to Wolfie's, and God knows what was said, because they're having a drink. And, and that is... It, it didn't necessarily violate the law, but it certainly violated the spirit of the law. The open meeting law has changed, though. It's become more strict, especially on the public record side of it. If you get somebody mad at you, they can make your lives miserable by just demanding minutes after minutes after. I've seen this happen in other towns, too. I know. And that's why we're very careful. And, and people get frustrated that we're not able to deal with things very in sometimes in a not timely manner. But there's not much you can do. And I, I think there's more upside to it than the downside. And so you just have to deal with it. But I think people forget that it, you know, we're so constrained sometimes. The other thing that's challenging, I think, and you, I know you feel this way, is it's tough to get people who want to get involved, especially younger people in politics. And, and you know, people like you, you know firsthand how tough it can be and how demanding just in terms of time being a, a public official can be. But you love it, and people are involved because are involved they love it. But there aren't that many people, it seems like, coming up to, to sort it's of huge, the next huge, generation. Huge issue. And um, one of the things that um, I think you and I share is um, this quote, never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. It's a Margaret Mead quote. Right. And um, I guess, I don't I think it was in high, you know, North Carolina Herman that I um, had it in a class. And it, it just always stuck with me. And I... And when things get particularly rough or whatever, I, I try to think of that. And then, you know, when you're trying to outreach the community, I mean, I, I do this because I love my community. Right. But I think about, oh my God, all the people that have done stuff before me, you know? I get emotional, but. Well, your dad's one of them. I mean, your dad was, uh, you know, he was the, 
a centerpiece of Burneson Town Government for many, many years. Well, that's one of the reasons I had hesitated to be a selectman because my, you know, I just know how time consuming it was. But you have to develop partnerships, you have to do outreach. And, and, and like I said, there are times when it's pretty rough and you, you, you just have to put it in perspective. Um, one of the things that put, has always put it in perspective for me is that John and um, Samuel Conable in June 19th of 1775, my relatives, we, we originally, um, my relative got a land grant in Berniston for fighting the French and Indian um, War. Yeah, yeah. And in that generation, the sons, John and Samuel, they um, signed up to fight in the American Revolution. This is when George Washington was losing. And it was like, oh my God, they're taking on this world power. And I think, what's my problem? I can go to this yeah. meeting. You know, get a grip. So, but I think it is really hard to get people involved. But you, you have to say, this is, you know, you have impact. If you, you can't get discouraged. You have to fight for your community. And I think, you know, it is sad that less people can, um, you know, have the opportunity to, to participate because it's harder. I mean, people are working harder. And you have so many demands nowadays. But, you know, you have to commit to your community. And, I, and, and that is one of the things that are really sad. We're, we're seeing less young people. I don't know. But uh, partnerships are important. And, and one of the things that I really enjoy about this job is reaching out to other communities and um, participating with other people. And, and because of this job, I, I have to say um, it's been very rewarding doing uh, multiple of things. I mean, one of the most scariest things to me was when we had the flooding of 2005. Oh, yeah. And, <coughs> you know, um, this is when um, uh, Mayor Forgy and I were calling each other in the middle of the night three o'clock at, you know, Sunday night, Columbus Day weekend. What the heck is going on? We can't get anybody. This was the year of Katrina, so things have definitely improved 100%, but there was nobody answering our phone calls. We called the governor's office on Tuesday morning that weekend, and, you know, some idiot said there couldn't possibly be as much damage out here because there wasn't anything out here. And I said, I had at least $4 million worth of damage. And he couldn't, he says, ah, oh, come on. And, I, and it would, turned out to be four and a half million. But there wasn't anybody to help me. And, and who came? It was Rita Thibodeau from Coleraine, who was the conservation district um, person in Greenfield. And she came down and opened up my whole view on natural resource and conservation service. And so I ended up being um, president of the Mass Conservation Districts because of that event. But the fact is now we have a partnership with Conservation Service. Um, and, and this is not, I'm not trying to sound like a resume building thing, but I'm a rep, um, a map, the municipal representative on Homeland Security. So we work with Homeland Security Council now. And one of the things we did, a very basic thing, was to get um, GPS units for every single highway department and get training. So when we have an event, they can take a picture of their culvert or their um, catch basin before the event and then, yeah. and then document to FEMA that this is what the condition was and then you document the debris. We're doing debris management planning. We're doing all these things that, you know, you don't think Homeland Security, but you know, you're trying to edge them away from the Bearcats and to do real things. No, I think this is incredibly important, and the reason why is, is we talked about this in the first show, and that is climate change. I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but some of the storms we've had have have rivaled anything. I mean, nothing lately in the last few years we have had microbursts, we have had floods, we have all have all kinds of events, and they're just going to get worse as climate change worsens. And some of these small communities are not ready to deal with it. So nope. it's great to hear these kinds of collaborations exist. Well, we have the Little Resilient Communities Group that we've been meeting since December of 2011, and it's all the communities up and down um, the Deerfield um, watershed, and Deerfield River watershed. And we, you know, are working together, and, um, you know, we need, I, I estimate we needed 110 million to begin with, and it's probably up to 150 million. But you know, actually, with UMass and different groups, we've we've gotten probably six or seven million. And is it exactly what we're doing? What, what, what we need to help the people on the ground to put their culverts in? No, but we are working for you know um, templates like the flooding 
template. So when you are a new selectman, you don't have to go through what I did right. in 2005. You know you need an emergency permit from um, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, honestly, Sunday night, you know, uh, um, I mean, well, Sunday morning, because this is like 3 o'clock when this happened, I declared an emergency and then told HAP to get coal cars out and dump a rock on Mill Village Road where the road was collapsing. I mean, I didn't know that I needed to go and get a permit from the Army Corps. And so I dumped rock and it was over 100 feet, but you know, the man was so nice. He came out and, you know, I said, Oh, it looks like if you measure from here to here, uh, 99 feet, you know. But I, it was a learning experience. So, what we're trying to do is, is we got a little mini grant with the Conservation District and the FERCOG to do template for flooding. So, when you have flooding, this is what you do. And, you know, it's like little toolkit things. And they're little, but when you, when you do them cumulatively, they're adding up. And we are building up to, and I, it is frustrating, but we're, we are building up to the biggest projects. And we were trying to help Shelburne and Buckland with their wells. We did do um, um, some repair work on the Sawmill River, the Conservation District. Um, you know, where, where the road was getting undermined, 47 and 63 joined there. And so you're outreaching, and there's, it's an education process. And so all this stuff is cu cumulative. And um, we're getting, like I said, our department has to be much more proactive and involved. And you have to scrutinize all your budgets. And you're working, you know, you're, the budget issues are huge. You, you, what we're doing is not sustainable. So you have to be creative. And, and so there is some tension because we want to create a bonus system where you're, you know, it's not, it's not good enough that people actually just show up. Yeah. They have to think of all the time. And so we want to be able to do a bonus system. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can, you know, give a little bit more vacation time or what, you know, just thank you kind of thing, acknowledgement that you're thinking out of the box. And, and that's what we have to do now. And, and I think that's happening um, because we are still delivering services. And it's a quality of life issue. Don't you also battle the perception that with all this regional planning, and you mentioned helping Buckland and Shelburne with their wells, there's a certain segment of people in Deerfield that are going to say, you know, let's worry about Deerfield first and not worry about everybody else. I mean, you always constantly have to battle with that, right, a little bit? Yes, but I have to tell you, people need to understand we're at the bottom. <laughs> This is like a big bowl, right. and the river starts in Vermont, and we're working with, con the reason why it was good to go through conservation districts, because we can work over the yeah. state line. So we're working with our counterparts in um, Vermont, and then all the way down. So what they're doing in the upper reaches of the river impact what's happening sure. here. And, and as you know, and I, and I know I repeat it all the time, but it's very serious. Um, our riparian buffers along the riverbank were really destroyed during Irene. We are, in fact, 16 feet or more lower in a lot of the areas along the riverbank. This is the erosion you're talking yes, about. Yes, yeah. it's been eroded. The banks have been eroding. So your events, when you have these extreme events, it's just much more serious. You ha your vulnerability is much more and serious. And to rebuild that is incredibly expensive. Oh. And you need the Army Corps of Engineers to come in and do it. And you're talking about multi-millions of dollars. It's, it's like $100,000 for 100 feet. Yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. And there's the permitting, and it's the long term, and yes. But you're, you just have to be creative now who you're outreaching to. You know, it, it, the selectman's job has changed a lot, and, um, and if you're going to do it right, but it does take a lot of time, and you go to different meetings. But being part of the Massachusetts Watershed Coalition, I have to tell you, I met Carolyn Sellers from um, Townsend. Now, when we had our presentations here for the pipeline, one of the things for the pipeline was, um, oh, we're going to put this little compressor station in Deerfield. And they showed us the picture of Southwick. <laughs> little compressor station. That was 2,000 horsepower. <laughs> the one in, you know, that they had originally po proposed was 120. And Carolyn emailed me and she says, Carolyn, I think you, you need to know that that was 2,000 versus 120,000. The biggest one they have is down in, in Georgia and it's, and it's like 100. And, and this is what it looks like. It's this big industrial thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And sure enough, you know, I mean, serious issues. But if I hadn't known Car Carolyn from the... Right. Mass Watershed Coalition, she would not have, I would not have had, had access to her information because originally they were going to put a compressor station in Townsend of equal size, and that was what alerted her to that. And, and so, you know, all this stuff comes together, and, it, and 
And like I said, it's just, there's a lot of overlap, you know, with the Homeland Security Council. Now, John Pachorek, our uh, police chief, is now the Western Mass Police Chief Representative. So, and, and Ed um, Lesko from Hatfield is right. the public health. So we're, we're like a little voting block. So we, we get a lot more done um, because people need our votes. And so, you know, it's, it's really nice that this is happening. And so, I, you know, there's good things happening. And then there's positive things. And I think people ultimately do love the quality of life in their community. And, and this, this is why they're willing maybe to step forward, hopefully. And, and do some volunteering. And what we're trying to do is make the volunteering more finite so it's not so overwhelming right. and so open-ended. So if we do this, is this subcommittee, a working committee you can participate on instead of being the full-blown um, position? What types of committees do you most need volunteers for? I mean, every town has vacancies, but are there boards that are more vacant than others? Well, um, Doug has put together our complete streets um, policy and this will get us to um, uh, hopefully we'll vote it in the next meeting. It's part of meeting. that compact, right? Yes. Yeah. And so that will put us in a position to get some money for our downtown. So hopefully maybe we can get a working group of people that are really interested in our um, downtown. And this is South Deerfield. Yes, yeah. South, South Deerfield, downtown village. And, and hopefully this will, you know, they'll work on this committee. We, you know, we have the um, CPA money, our community um, com, um, preservation. Pre preservation money that's still being matched by the state dollar for dollar. So, you know, there's a few dollars we could match towards a grant. Because a lot of times the grants, they're, they're just getting so much harder to get. And... Um, now they're requiring matches. So if you have a little bit of a pot of money and use that towards a, a match, you maybe you know access a huger amount that just has for, a real impact. Just for background, the Complete Streets Initiative is an effort to make downtown and area streets accessible to all forms of transportation. Well, it's the right? walk. It's right. It's walkability, walkability sociability. Right. You want people to get out and exercise. Right have a vibrant downtown and we and we have we have this lovely village so we just you know we need to make it more attractive for people to you know move around and get and, and get and and have local businesses and all kinds of stuff so it would seem like South Deerfield would be especially ripe for this because it's a very walkable area and, yes. and nothing is too far from anything really uh, so I would think but I would again you're talking about I mean how, what kind of a time frame are we talking about in terms of getting this from from planning to completion I would think it would take a while. Well, it's a couple year process, always, from, you know, grants and stuff. But if people felt that they were, you know, they could commit to a project versus a position. And, and so we're trying to tailor that kind of thing. Do you find it's easier to get people to get behind a certain initiative rather than just, oh, just help us with everything? Yes. Yeah, it is. And, and you know, you can, there are people that, you know, you can reach out to and we, talk, you know, talk about it at Slickman's office, you know, if you have an idea or you have a thought. I mean, people don't really hesitate to call me, so, you know, hopefully people will call. And yeah, I would think you'd get quite a few phone calls about yeah. stuff. Yeah, oh, and I, and I honestly return, there's only a couple people in the, my term that I say do not call me anymore because they <laughs> have been so rude. Because, you know, I mean, that's part of the job, why you want to do it. You want to help your community yeah. have a good quality of life. and. And even if something seems very minor, if it's really bothering somebody, that's that for that person, that's a serious issue. Exactly. So you want to try to address it, and you know, I honestly try to, and and I think all our town employees to try to do a very good job. It's just it's just hard sometimes because you know people don't call up and say, "Oh, you're doing such a good job." You know, it's you only get complaints. But in the scheme of things, we you know, it's okay. It was what James Michael Curley, the former mayor of Boston, said about politics. It's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. And some people get into politics and get into local government because it's like an ego trip. And they get there and they realize, oh my God, there's actual work involved here. You knew going in what kind of work you were facing. You knew it wasn't about ego, it was about getting stuff done. No, and actually, I, and that's why I enjoy it, is because you know, you're trying to make it be better for people and, and, and have a better community. But I think, you know, what's been so frustrating or what's so hard is, you know, we just don't have any money anymore. I mean, the federal government, all the, whatever the federal government doesn't want to do, it pushes down the state. Whatever the state doesn't want to do, they push down the lo local level, and we have nowhere to go. Right. And we have no ability to raise extra money. We're constrained by two and a half. And, and the state, I have to say, you know, 
it's going to be really sad to have Marty Barrett go from the schools because, you know, the schools take such a big chunk of our budget. It's, you know, between the high 60s to the low 70s, depending on the year, of our budget. And, and um, you know, with that kind of chunk taken out, it's very frustrating to work together. Marty's been so nice and so easy to work with. And, and I hope the new superintendent will be able to work with us because, you know, um, it is tough. But to, to be fair to the schools, when I started, it was about 30, 33 percent, 34 percent of the cost of educating a child was paid for by the state. <laughs> We're down to 20 yeah. percent and the cost is skyrocketed. And then you have a governor that wants to, um, you know, have more charter schools. And it's not fair because it guts the private schools, I mean, the public schools, and it's undermining public schools because it's one thing school choice. We have some issues with school choice, but, you know, at least it's reasonable. But the charter schools get to charge whatever their charge is, whatever it is, and we have to pay it, and we pay it up front off of our cherry sheet. And, and it, they can pick their students that they take, too. Yes. And that's the other yes. thing. And they're basically private schools funded with public money. We all know what this is. But I, and I'm not, for, for us out here, it really undermines. Yeah. And if they can find a way to hold, hold local regional school districts harmless, funding wise, then fine. But they've never been able to do that. And that's been really the, the elephant in the room on that. Um, one final topic before we uh, let you go. We've got a town meeting coming up. What kinds of stuff can we expect? Are there new initiatives? What kind of things that we don't know about coming up on town meeting? Well, forward? there's the mosquito um, warrant article, which is a new thing. Um, but in general, it's our regular stuff, and, um, and, and people are frustrated. They're paying, you know, more and more in taxes, and it seems, you know, we, we have to be tight on our, yeah. on our services and stuff. And so it is frustrating for people. I totally get it. But I hope people, we're, we're going to have an information night and go over our budget and the warrant articles. We, I hope we're going to have plenty of, um, you know, information uh, beforehand on it. And I hope people will watch it. And if they have questions, they can get it back to our selectman's office, and, and we can hopefully answer it. Um, there's, you know, there's not a lot we can do. The budget constraints are there, and um, and it is really. But but I feel like, you know, we've addressed the things that have been happening. Like, um, you know, we've tried to make our the town workers' place safer. We we have a new highway garage, which is certainly far safer than the old highway garage. Oh, yeah. um, you know, we have severe weather events. Last year wasn't so bad. You know, hopefully this year won't be so bad. Um, you know, we've had internal management issues like people retiring and, and, and transitioning in our office. But, you know, I think Doug is doing a really great job and we have great department heads now. And, and so I hope people are being patient and understanding and how we're trying to keep the costs as, as best we can and, and they'll be supportive of the process and to be involved in the process. If they have legitimate complaints or leg legitimate questions, they need to, they need to work with us. Um, we're certainly open to everything. I'm, I'm open to any ideas. Anybody has got an idea, it doesn't matter how crazy it is. Let's see, let's pursue it. We're constantly trying to do that um, with our employees. They need to be prepared, but be innovative. Think of ways that we can do. I mean, fortunately, Kevin, Scarbo at the highway department is getting a really good team together and over the next, last few years we, we've emerged with ways to cut costs and still do more things and, and it's, it's exciting sometimes you know it can be really exciting I mean this is the kind of stuff that makes me excited anyway and that's <laughs> why you're doing the job you're doing and that's why it's important to, to have you continue to and who knows I mean there could be some new blood coming into the board of selectmen there could be new all kinds of new things could be happening but it's still a great town, and one of the reasons is great quality of life is because I think you have a government that's responsive to what people are concerned about, and they recognize that people are here because they want to be, not because they have to be, and Absolutely. that's the best part. I mean, I was so thrilled when I got this job. The best part about it was I was going to get to come back and work in Deerfield every day, and work. I, I've always loved this area. I loved it when I covered it 20 years ago, and I love it now. So. I'm thrilled to be back. I'm thrilled to have you on the show. We'll do it again soon. Thanks All for right. coming in. Thank you. Carolyn Shores Ness has been my guest from the Deerfield Select Board. I'm Chris Collins. That's South County Spotlight. We'll talk to you next time. For all of us here at FCAT, 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 have a good day.